All right, everybody, it is my great pleasure to, I am absolutely going to mispronounce your name and I apologize in advance. I'm a, I would like to pronounce, uh, we'd like to introduce to you uh, Sri Aravinda Krishnan Thagarajan. Oh, I almost got it anyway. Um, he's presenting on OmniRing, uh, scaling up private payments without a trusted setup. And this is joint work with Russell Lai, Victoria Rong, Tim Ruffing, uh, Dom Dominique Schroeder, and uh, Jifan Wang, which I am almost certain I got at least one of those names incorrect also. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk. First, uh, uh, it's a lot of pressure for me to start the conference with my talk. Uh, let's see. I, I do a good job. All right. Uh, one sec. How does this work? Ah, OK. Uh, OK, so um, thanks for the introduction. So I'll be talking about our paper, uh, OmniRing. Um, so our work mainly focuses on uh, formalizing the uh, functionality of ring confidential transactions, the security guarantees, uh, while giving um, an efficient uh, construction that can be uh, instantiated uh, almost immediately in the current day Monero. OK? Uh, so ring confidential transactions has uh, three components. Uh, the first one is sender privacy. Uh, amount confidentiality and receiver privacy. And this is what is currently used uh, in uh, to achieve privacy and anonymity in Monero today. OK, so sender privacy is achieved by uh, a primitive similar to linkable ring signature that gives you an anonymity within an anonym anonymity set and uh, also giving the capability to uh, detect uh, a double spending. So a bit more introduction. Um, let me start with ring signatures, where uh, a verifier can verify a signature on a document that has been signed uh, on behalf of an anonymity set. So in this case, the uh, red user knows that one of these three users has signed the document, but not necessarily who signed it, right? Uh, moving, jumping from ring signatures to linkable ring signatures, the verifier can link two signatures if the same signer had signed uh, from the anonymity set. So this uh, analogously gives uh, the detection for uh, double spending attacks uh, in case of Monero. All right, so the next component is uh, amount confidentiality, which is achieved through uh, Peterson commitments, confidential transactions, um, which uh, hides the amount inside a commitment uh, while giving the capability to uh, verify if the amounts are balanced or not. So to look at it uh, in a more fine-grained detail. The green user here puts, puts the amount 23 inside a commitment, right? And uh, sends this commitment to the red user here. Um, of course, the adversary doesn't know what's inside the commitment as of yet. Uh, he doesn't know ever. Uh, then the key, the opening information for this commitment is passed on to the red user who can now open the uh, commitment and uh, verify if, uh, check what amount was inside. And uh, uh, the adversary can, or any external user can verify if the uh, amounts in these commitments that the uh, green user had, which was passed on to the red user, uh, are indeed balanced. That's the only information that's known to the external user. All right. So the third component is the receiver privacy, uh, which uh, which is achieved uh, through what is called stealth addresses. Um, let me directly jump into the detail of what stealth addresses is. Uh, so here, uh, the 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 blue user who wants to receive money sends his long-term uh, address, which is the master public key, to uh, other users from whom he wants to receive money. The red user signs some money and sends it to a user who is, I mean, no one knows who he is, and happens again and happens again, right? But the point is, all these uh, three uh, uh, recipient addresses have indeed been uh, derived from this uh, master public key that this blue user had given, right? Uh, but the adversary doesn't know this. The adversary cannot, uh, obviously, doesn't know that uh, all these this, this fresh-looking recipients are indeed belonging to the same user. Okay, so in this way, the recipient addresses are um, unlinkable from each other. Okay, 
All right, so what are the security properties of Ring CT? Uh, first is balance, where um, the amount that a person has is what he spends, nothing more, and obviously he should not do a double spend. And then you have privacy, where you have uh, privacy for the sender, privacy for the uh, receiver, and the amount that is being transacted is uh, also hidden, right? And the third property is non-slanderability, which says that an adversary cannot sign a valid uh, document on behalf of a harness user, which also you can think of as uh, unforgeability of a digital signature. Okay. Uh, why do we need to formalize these uh, the functionalities and the security guarantees? Because it gives you a, a, a concrete platform uh, to design your protocols to understand what the security guarantees of a protocol are. And once you have a f formalized uh, security notions, when you have multiple protocols, you can compare them on, on the basis of their efficiency and so on and so forth, and not necessarily worry about, uh, oh, one, one protocol gives me this guarantee, the other protocol gives me the other guarantee, and you, this is a trade-off. You need not be worried about that anymore. So it gives a, it gives a guideline to comparison of different protocols. Okay? And uh, naturally, if you, do, if you end up not formalizing, there, there can be problems at times. As, as uh, in one of our papers, we found the denial of spending attack on the uh, zero coin model, uh, where the adversary could essentially uh, uh, create a transaction and use the tag of a harness user and spend the transaction, which is valid, right? Now, if the adversary ends up doing this, uh, the, uh, the harnessed user, whenever he comes online or whenever he tries to uh, spend his transaction with the same tag, it always ends up being a double spend because users can link these tags and he, they know that this tag has already spent the money, right? So essentially, the adversary has forced the uh, harness user to not spend his money, right? So. Uh, and we found that this bug actually existed in a lot of coins uh, out there, and uh, it, 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 it also was uh, a, a bug in the formal model that was uh, initially proposed in 2016, but not the scheme itself, but the model, the security guarantee. Okay. Uh, there have been two attempts uh, at formalizing Ring CT. The first one uh, was in 2017, uh, referred to as Ring CT 2.0. They fail to formalize uh, stealth addresses, thereby not capturing the guarantee of receiver anonymity. And uh, their definitions uh, of security are a bit weak uh, in the sense that they fail to capture many real world scenarios. And they end up using a trusted setup uh, in, order to, uh, in order to gain better efficiency uh, for their construction. Uh, the most uh, recent attempt was the Ring CD 3.0. Um, you can see the iterations in numbers. Um, so the anonymity definition in this case is split between uh, receiver anonymity and spender anonymity. It's not, uh, and it's not clear if these two definitions together play uh, in in achieving privacy for the whole system, right? And uh, their definition for balance uh, is a tad weak. Uh, um, compared to what we give, uh, in the sense that they uh, they either uh, restrict the power of the adversary or they make a, a little bit of a stronger assumption. All right. Okay. So to summarize our contribution, we first of all give a strong uh, model in the sense we uh, capture stealth addresses, thereby receiver anonymity. We also capture the view viewability or trackability feature that's. Uh, that's prevalent in Monero today. Uh, we end up giving strong security guarantees for balance and privacy as a, as a comprehensive uh, uh, privacy guarantee. And we have what is called uh, the one ring to rule them all, a lot of the ring reference, uh, to achieve uh, better efficiency and uh, better anonymity. I will, come, I will come back to this a bit later. And we have less assumptions in the sense that we do not rely on um, any uh, external secure channel between users. We, we do every, every, everything on the ledger. Okay? So let me uh, jump right into the formalization of the functionality. So users obviously want to set up and they want to join the network. Uh, so the user first runs a setup algorithm that generates the public parameters that are necessary for the Ring CD uh, scheme. 
And then they set up this uh, stealth address, right? They need to set up this one-time address. They run this stealth address key generation algorithm that outputs this master public key and master secret key, uh, which, is, uh, which is done one time, right? And uh, a transaction, uh, basically, in our, in our formalization is, is a ring of accounts, uh, the tags of the uh, accounts that are spending money, and the target accounts, and some arbitrary message or metadata mu, right? Okay. Uh, so how do you spend? The f in order to spend, the user first needs to know what the target accounts are. Where does he want to send, spend, uh, send the money to, right? So he runs this one-time account generation algorithm. Uh, he takes the master public key of the recipient and the amount that he wants to send to this recipient, that, that the algorithm outputs the kind key of the kind and the uh, account of the uh, target uh, user, right? And you can think of this kind key as, um, as the blinding factor or the randomness that goes into the commitment uh, of the kind. Uh, then he run, so once the once the destination or the target accounts are set up, he knows where to send the money to. Then he runs the spend algorithm that takes as input the ring of accounts um, and uh, source account from where he spends the money, the target accounts where he sends the money to, and some message, and it outputs the signature or the spend proof that he publishes to the ledger. Okay. Um, once the spend proof and the transactions are a transaction is onto the ledger, you need to verify if everything is fine. So the verification algorithm checks if the amounts are balanced between the uh, source accounts and the target accounts, and it checks if the uh, tags do not reoccur in in order to prevent double spending. And uh, it also makes a crucial check where it's uh, the the accounts that are used in the rings have at some point in time appeared as a target account, right? Uh, he, the, a user cannot generate uh, like fresh accounts out of thin air and include it in the ring, okay? And uh, moving on to receiving. So, okay, the money has been uh, sent to the receiver. Now he needs to do something to you know, make the, money, the funds that he received spendable again, right? So he runs the receive algorithm that takes the master secret key of himself and the target account that's sp uh, specified in the uh, transaction. And the algorithm outputs the kind key that he needs to learn, the amount, the one-time secret key, and the tag, right? So with this information, uh, the funds become spendable for him when he wants to later spend whenever he wants, right? Um, one additional check that needs to be performed is that uh, when a receiver receiver uh, receives funds from uh, many many different times, he needs to ensure that the tag of every time he receives the funds are different. Otherwise, he receives money maybe twice to the same tag, but he can only spend the tag once. That means he can only spend one of those uh, receipts and not both. Right? He needs to ensure this. Um, all right. So. Our ring CD construction uh, has two steps. Uh, the first step is we give a generic construction where the uh, the spender, who uh, whoever he's spending, he takes a complicated language uh, and throws it into a, a signature of knowledge box that outputs the spend proof. Right. So uh, I will come. I will come to uh, the signature of knowledge. Of the next step now. So the next step is to instantiate the signature of knowledge, right? So we rely on the uh, bulletproof framework that was uh, done by Boons et al. in 2018. Uh, uh, note that it's already used in Monero to prove uh, range proofs of the uh, amounts, where the spender needs to prove that the amount that's hidden in the commitment is within some range, OK? He needs to do this, and uh, bulletproof is already being used for this. And uh, bulletproofs enable uh, you to prove uh, uh, algebraic relations um, between in integers. Uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, they do not natively uh, imply a, a ring signature or a ring CT. Okay? So this is where we, we had to work a bit to extend this to ring CT. So we extend the bulletproof framework to a, a zero knowledge proof system where you can prove uh, relations on discrete logarithm uh, representation. And uh, um, note that our proof can handle not just algebraic relations on integers, but also on group elements. OK? 
can, if, if it's a bit too technical, I will go fast. <laughs> All right, the step one, uh, just a very high level key points of our generic construction. Um, we use uh, the we use a public key encryption system to uh, for uh, giving this viewability and trackability feature, uh, thereby removing any um, assumption of a secure channel between users. Okay, and uh, wondering to rule them all comes here now. Uh, so we we can have multiple spends, meaning that uh, spending from multiple accounts to be done from the same ring and not ne necessarily have different rings for different spends. Right? So this gives us a K out of KN anonymity, where K is the number of accounts from where you want to spend, and KN is the size of the ring. And uh, if one of the keys, uh, if one of the spends, uh, one of the accounts is de-anonymized, uh, you still have K minus 1 out of KN minus 1 anonymity. Uh, let me show this uh, pictorially, uh, since this is the first talk in the morning. Uh, OK, so let's say that uh, there are three accounts that are being spent from three rings, right? So the arrows point down to who's actually spending, all right? So let's say that the, the, the first guy, the blue guy, gets de-anonymized. That means now that the whole ring is uh, useless for the anonymity of the other two uh, spenders, right? But now, let's say that you have one ring, and you have multiple uh, spenders, the three, uh, three spenders here. And if one of them gets de-anonymized, it's just his key that's not contributing to the anonymity of the rest two spends anymore, you still have a large ring for anonymity of the other two accounts. Okay, this is a, a, a feature of our generic construction. Uh, let me now move on to uh, the instantiation of our Omni ring. Like the first time I think I'm mentioning Omni ring 24 slides. Uh, so we instantiate the public key encryption scheme with uh, the elliptic curve integrated encryption scheme uh, from Kramer Shoup in 2001. Uh, we have Pedersen commitments for uh, confidential transactions. We have a pseudo random function for the tag, how, uh, like tag of an uh, account. And uh, we instantiate the zero knowledge proof, uh, the, the, the signature of knowledge, sorry, uh, with our extended variant of the bulletproof, which I'll briefly show now. Okay, so bulletproof, how does it work? So. Uh, as I said, they want to prove the range proof of an amount, right? They want to show that this amount, this value lies between uh, a certain range, right? So what they do is they represent this uh, value A in terms of a vector A and vector B and commit to this uh, vector in the form of this uh, capital A over there in step number two. And they prove this complicated, uh, sophisticated relation uh, to show that actually the amount lies in a particular range, okay? Uh, the key caveat uh, for proving uh, soundness of this proof is that the prover does not know any non-trivial uh, discrete log representation of the identity with respect to the uh, base uh, base with which the commitment A is actually generated. Okay. All right. So. In our case, what do we want? In our case, we want to have ring membership where there's a ring of uh, keys, right? And you want to prove the knowledge that at particular index, you know the particular secret key, right? Uh, for achieving ring signature or the ring CT, okay? So uh, the challenge here is that how to encode this relation into this commitment A that I showed before. And uh, the, even, uh, the, the, the more important challenge is actually that the prover uh, meaning that the spender, whoever is spending, may know the discrete log discrete logarithm relations between different keys in the ring, right? And this does not let us uh, use the bulletproof sound, soundness proof as it is. Okay, so we need to do something slightly different. We do it. Um, we do it by actually committing uh, to this uh, A with a different base where the G G vector before is now replaced by G W, which is uh, which ensures that the discrete log relations between the uh, um, between the members of the between the keys of the ring are not known to the prover anymore. So now, uh, when you have this commitment with respect to this uh, new base, uh, you run the bullet proof uh, uh, proof system as before twice, and uh, you can extract uh, the witness and uh, and the sound proof goes through. Okay, and uh, running bullet proof twice could could potentially uh, uh, incur some cost, and we could get away with it some with uh, optimizations that are pretty straightforward. 
So this means that you actually end up running the bulletproof test once. Okay. Fine. So uh, step one, step two is done. So OmniRing, uh, we do implement and we do have some optimizations. So we can leverage the batch verification technique that's also used in bulletproofs. Unfortunately, um, the uh, Monero Research Lab have uh, pointed out some um, some uh, errors in the numbers that we presented and. Uh, uh, the the reason for those errors are actually that the our security proof does not allow us to uh, uh, leverage uh, so much of uh, improvement that we thought we could. But we are now working to fix this, and hopefully we are actually the same uh, as what we had before. Hopefully, all right. And uh, we could actually have uh, the transaction size to be uh, logarithmic in the size of the ring. Uh, I mean as of course, the, 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 the proof size happens to be uh, logarithmic because we end up using bullet proofs. Uh, and the, the set of target accounts and the set of uh, source accounts are usually small, so that's also fine. Uh, but usually the, the entire ring needs to be sent as part of the transaction, right? This could mean that it's linear, in the size of the transaction could be linear in the size of the ring that you're sending. But we could actually uh, use a log logarithmic size description of the ring by using the technique of uh, Chatter and Green from 2018 called the recovery sampling technique. All right, so that means that now we can have not just logarithmic size proofs, but you can actually have logarithmic size transactions. Okay, asymptotically, I mean, I know it's not so interesting, but let me I'll get, come to the concrete numbers just in a bit. So asymptotically, just to compare the various constructions so far we had, uh, we have had. So um, as you may see, the first one, the Monero with uh, bulletproof range proofs uh, that's used currently, uh, the, the, the signature or the spend proof size in the, is in the linear uh, uh, to the ring size. So, um, and then uh, in 2.0, it's, um, it's actually not dependent on the ring size anymore. But note that uh, they do use uh, pairing and uh, a trusted setup to achieve such a, such a uh, efficiency. And they do have uh, really high hidden constant factors in their construction. Uh, ring CD 3.0 achieves the uh, proof size to be logarithmic in the size of the ring. Um, uh, but uh, uh, they do not integrate the, uh, uh, the range proof and the ring CD proof into a single system, which we do. and thereby the, uh, the multiplicative factor of the size of the source uh, account set is actually inside the logarithmic expression for us here. Um, all right. What about concrete numbers? Um, so the uh, proof size in terms of the uh, elements, uh, group elements, um, uh, in the in the current day use of uh, ring size of uh, 11, uh, our Omni ring has uh, something between 20 to 30, uh, 20 to 30 group elements, where the current day use uh, in Monero is somewhere between, um, let's say, uh, it's between 30 to 40. And uh, as you can see that as you increase the uh, size of the ring, the difference is really clear. Um, if, if you want to have uh, uh, a ring size of uh, you know 128. Uh, you would our our Omni ring gives still around 30, whereas the Monero, uh, the current the current day Monero, the size really blows up uh, to several hundreds. Okay, that's proof size. What about the uh, amount of time spent on computing this proof size? Um, so in the current day use, uh, Omni ring gives uh, slightly uh, takes a slightly bit more time than what Monero does. Uh, but not in a huge order. And uh, uh, as you increase the ring size, uh, the difference uh, sl slightly increases, but not uh, to a prohibitive limit. Okay. Most importantly, the verification time. Right. Uh, note that these numbers are uh, without the batch verification, which we are still working on. Um, so the Omni ring, um, as as you blow up the uh, ring size, uh, the um, uh, the amount of time taken to verify uh, is less than less than few tens uh, for us in terms of milliseconds in Omni ring, whereas it gradually slightly blows up in Monero. You can see the difference here, and uh, hopefully with batch numbers we would have much much better numbers batch verification. Sorry, okay. Um, 
can you use uh, OmniRing in Monero today? Okay, I hope someone is thinking about this. Uh, if you are, yes, you can. Uh, we 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 need to modify the language that we are proving uh, to to be compatible with the tag that is currently used in Monero, so that our Omni once you start using OmniRing, it's also backward compatible with whatever was running in Monero till today, right? So that you prevent double spendings altogether. Um, if you modify this language, we note that we still maintain this uh, efficiency that I presented in terms of asympt asymptotic and also concrete efficiency that I just showed you. We can still retain this. And uh, to kind of conclude my talk, um, it's very important to uh, formalize the functionality and the security guarantees when you develop a system, especially as, as crucial and monetary monetary significance uh, that Monero holds in the current world. Um, and the, the, the ring selection of the ring CT where you select which keys go into your ring, that's, that's uh, very crucial, very important. And uh, uh, we are actually actively working on it. You can soon expect a uh, paper to be out. Our, and our generic construction that I showed, which I briefly touched upon, uh, is compatible with any uh, future cryptographic improvements that may come forth, right? Uh, in terms of uh, proof systems or anything, so it's uh, it's future proof. Um, and Omni Ring, where you have one ring for all spend, uh, many spends, give, uh, actually ensures that you can actually use large rings. That means better anonymity and better privacy for the spending keys that you have in Monero, which means better privacy in Monero. All right. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, please check out our paper. Uh, it's it's an e-print, uh, 580. That's our code. And questions, please. I believe we have a microphone to be passed around for questions. So if anybody has any questions for our event. Yes, sir. Over here. Microphone coming your way. Yeah, so thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I think one of the really interesting things about Omni, the Omni Ring paper is this formalization of the Ring CT uh, idea. Uh, but I was wondering, uh, did you also uh, kind of uh, look at the current Ring CT construction in Monero. Does that fit in the formalization that you've done? And uh, like, would it actually live up to the kind of the security uh, definitions that you use? Oh, uh, it, it, I mean, it definitely does. With our formalization of the functionality is as generic as possible. So the current day Monero falls under the bracket of our formalization of the functionality, right? And uh, um, so, you could, so you could use this formalization to also reason about the current Ring CT construction that's being used. In, yes, you know. yes, 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 mm. yes. You can, yes, you can. So yeah, so our our initial study started as formalizing the current day Monero, right? Uh, but then, uh, it, I mean, crypto this this evolves constantly, and we had to update our formalization. Now we believe that we have a, as generic as possible construction that encompasses today's Monero. So, so do you include a, a security proof for this? Current? Uh, uh, not in our paper. Okay. Uh, not in our paper. We don't. Uh, we don't. And we don't uh, uh, prove the security guarantees of today's Monero in our paper. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question over here. Um, with on the ring uh, versus current Monero, does the uh, algebraic structure of the key images change? Ah, OK, so uh, that's what I meant by uh, changing the language uh, uh, slightly to ensure that the key image structure is retained. Okay. So uh, our, the construct, when you check out the paper, the main construction in our, in our main body, uh, the key image is generated slightly differently. But we do discuss how we can make it compatible with Monero today, uh, the a key image of Monero today in the appendix, which, which, which still retains the efficiency. Great, I think we have time for just one more right here. So I was wondering if you were to use OmniRing in Monero today, 
and you wanted to increase the, the ring size, at, at what point would it break? And what would cause it to break? It seems from your charts like maybe it'd be creating the transaction, but I, you know, it's, uh, what, what would be the thing practically that would break and at what ring size would it break approximately? Uh, I mean, I, I, I think one, I mean, as, as you saw in the charts, the, the limitation is the, uh, the time that you spend in proving, uh, generating this proof size. So potentially, if you think of ring sizes of 1,000 keys, uh, I think it's still good. But if you go further than that, I think uh, it depends on the use case. It depends on what you consider as a break. So yeah, but that's a limitation, yeah. All right, everybody, thank you very much again, Arvind, for your wonderful talk on OmniRing.